Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisance. All glories to the assembled devotees. This video is really to thank all of the people who supported me over the years. It's particularly my ancestors, the demigods, and the devotees. Family, friends, all of that. This is to bless y'all. You know, I was in the shower this morning. And some thoughts started coming to me. And it was pretty much about Eshu. Eshu Alekbara. Anybody who knows about my social media accounts, they know that pretty much I've handed over pretty much all of my social media accounts to the purpose of spreading Krishna's message. And when you look at the Facebook account and you look at the cover photo, you can clearly see that Eshu's Veve, his sigil, his symbol is there right over my page. So therefore, Eshu is the conduit or the messenger for things coming from the higher abode to this world of mortals. He's a conduit. When you have an X and a Y chromosome that represents the X being female and the Y representing male, they both have something in common. They meet at the crossroads. The X has a crossroads or a spot in the middle where the opposing directions meet and the letter Y has a fork. When you come to a fork in the road in your life, when you come to a crossroads and you must make a decision, the pre predominating deity is Eshu, a very intriguing deity. Very, very intriguing person. You really should read into Eshu. You can spell it various ways. E-X-U. E-S-H-U. He's also known as Legba. And he's also known as Elegba. And he's also known as Legbara and Elegbara. So whenever you hear any combination of Elegba or Eshu, the deity of the crossroads, he's a trickster. He has horns. It's just, it's a lot of things to go into about Eshu. But one thing you must remember when dealing with Eshu is you got to deal with him with respect. You can't play with Eshu. You can't act like you're his equal because he knows things you don't know. Because not only does he stand behind your doorway, he stands behind the doorways of your friends and your enemies. And he's always intriguing and you don't know. Eshu can play the side of your enemy very well. He can go and give your enemies advice. He can go and tell your enemies what you're up to. This is what he does. But at the end of the day, whatever Eshu does, it always seems to bring Krishna or Lord Vishnu into the forefront. You may say, why is this guy talking about Hindu deities in relationship to African deities? Well, for me personally, when I look at religion, I see clothes. When I look at religion, I see body. But when I look at spirituality, when I look at spirit, when I look at the realm of the absolute, I just see the soul. That's all I can see. So for you, it may be African, and for you, it may be Indian. But for me, it's something more significant than our bodily titles, our temporary bodily beliefs and our limitations due to bodies of waters and man-made borders. It's way beyond that for me. So, everything Eshu does seems to lead back to the glorification of Lord Vishnu or serving the purpose of Lord Vishnu. And if you look at the stories of someone camp called Narada Muni, Narada Muni, He's a universal sage. He travels all around the universe. He's a messenger of the gods. He's very intriguing. There's so many stories where the demigods or the beings that you generally, the people worship, the demigods, devatas, it just means they're everywhere. So devatas is Netaru. Netaru is the same thing. Netaru represents the, the forces that com comprise the Mahatapa or the sum totality of the material world. That's Netaru. And the beings that comprise the sum totality of this material world are the devatas. Different devatas represent different parts of the cosmos or different parts of the bodies of God. Different devas, different uh, deities. Okay? Good. So once you're dealing with Netaru 
and you're dealing with Narad Muni. Narad Muni was always the sage that could go amongst either the demons or the demigods and get respected by both. Like, you know, Narad Muni could just walk in on an assembly of demonic kings and they would all bow to him and give him their respects. They would give him a comfortable place to sit and at least offer him something to drink. And likewise, whenever he appeared in the assembly of the demigods, the effect was the same. So we get an idea that although there may be two streams of thought in the universe, there may be a demonic stream of thought and there may be a devotional stream of thought. But what we find is that they always meet somewhere in the middle. And that middle dot, that black dot, that white dot in the middle of the yin yang symbol, that nexus where the letter Y meets, that crossroads where the letter X meets, it's all represented by Narad Muni or Eshu. Because once again, these are universal translators. I mean, Narad Muni has went so far as to go and tell the demigods one thing about the demons, then he will go to the demons and tell them another. And then when you see the end result, that's why you should read the Bhagavad Purana or the Pur Bhagavad basically means God. So when you read the Bhagavad Purana, you're reading the histories of God and his exploits on the planet Earth and throughout this material universe and in the spiritual world. So in the Bhagavad Purana or Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll see many stories about Eshu, doing, uh, Eshu or Narad Muni doing some, some wild things. And remember, when I say Eshu and then when I say Narad Muni, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are exactly the same person, but they represent the same archetype, archetypes or the same energy patterns. Just like you have, you cannot mention anything without mentioning Ganesha because Ganesha stands at the doorway. So right there, you see another one of Eshu's attributes. Ganesha stands at the doorway. He can either bless or he can block your endeavors. And the same thing with Eshu. People will leave pennies quarters candy no copper mostly and they'll leave candy at the crossroads wherever you see four-way direction roads you can leave offerings there for SU according to a prescription or prescribed method how y'all feel all right according to a prescribed method and you will get a karmic reaction you know most people when they dealing with SU they really want money you know but who doesn't want money in this age right but yeah SU so people leave him things at the crossroads because the nexus is where it's all at so we we get an idea that the supreme lord is neither what we would call materially good or materially evil or materially bad because just like when the sun rises in the morning right the sun is not like me and you it doesn't discriminate it shines on everybody the effect may be different but the sun shines on everybody for some people the sun kills them and for some people the sun gives you life well, let me tell you something. In these material bodies, even if the sun gives you a temporary benefit in a black body, that's cool. But even the Bible confirms and the Vedas confirm that from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, the duration of your life is tampered. It's decreased. So actually, the aging process is directly connected to the movement of Surya being driven, Surya Vamsa, the solar dynasty, being driven across your sky daily by Capri or Capri, the Kepara, Keparura, the beetle of God, the dung beetle. Remember, the dung beetle has such an important job to push the sun across the sky. But the dung beetle originates in poop. You know, you got to understand the lotus flower, all of these symbolism come from a low place and it rises to a high place. Well, that's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was trying to tell people. Just consider yourself no more than a blade of grass, more tolerant than an oak tree, more lowly than a worm in stool. This is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is saying, that it is the key to connecting with God. It's the humility, the deep humility that a Capri has praised, been praised in the Egyptian society and in modern society for thousands of years. But it's yet it's a lowly dung beetle that if you went upstate New York today, or if you went to the Caribbean where they, you know, catching Zika and all of that, and you saw a dung beetle, you would be like, ew, that's yuck. But the ancients, they didn't see it like that. 
they saw that out of the most humble places, out of the most lowly places, come the greatest things and the greatest interactions with life. A lot of people are averse to bees. That's because they're ignorant. They think a bee is going to sting them when a bee is one of the most peaceful things you could ever see on the planet Earth. Plus, he knows once he uses his, his stinger once, he's sacrificing his life. Because a bee is not a war machine. A hornet, a wasp, they could sting you unlimited times and bring you so much pain and suffering and give you nothing in return. They are warriors, they are killers. But a bee, he can only hurt you one time. But the rest of the bee, his entire life, is value for you. <laughs> it's interesting, a bee can only hurt you once. Speaking of which, I wanted to mention that um, in this book, Sri Krishna, Lord of Love, he says something very interesting that I would like to share with people. Speaking about the progression of the four ages from Kreta Yuga or Satya Yuga, the age of purity or truth or reality, when our consciousness was turned inwards. It's very interesting. People were not living for material pleasure at that time because they were actually seeing their soul. The soul mirror was very pure in the age of Satya Yuga. So it was easy to see your real self and to see the source of bliss. It wasn't 100%, but it was less contaminated than it is today. It was for all intents and purposes compared to a man of this age, it was definitely 100% in comparison. So in this age, your duration of life, Satya Yuga, Kreta Yuga, your duration of life was determined by the fact that you had bone marrow. Your life force, your life airs, your prana was focused inside the bone marrow. So as long as you had marrow in your bones, your life would live. So people were living in the hundreds of thousands of years during Satya Yuga. Then in the next age, the silver, silver age, Treta Yuga, your life force was concentrated in your bones. So as long as you had a bone structure, as long as you had a healthy bone structure, as long as all your bones wasn't crushed or deteriorated through disease, you had life force. Your prana was located in your bones during Treta Yuga. During Dwapara Yuga, your life force was centered in your blood. So as long as you had blood in your body, your prana would work, you would live. So during Treta Yuga, people would live tens of thousands of years. And during Dwapara Yuga, the previous age to this one, people would live thousands of years. And then when you get to Kali Yuga, guess where your life force is centered? Your prana is centered in food. As long as you have access to food, your life will have, remember, the right foods now. The longer you spend in that first aisle of the supermarket, generally the longer you'll live because that's the foods that the human is designed for. Don't talk about all oh, vegetarians are killers just like meat eaters. That's not the subject. Everything has to die for something to live. So in order for you to live, plants have to die, okay? So we can't escape that, you know? But in the prior age, in like Satya Yuga, people were subsisting off of the etheric energy, astral energy, energy in the air, solar energy. They didn't really have fruits on the planet Earth and vegetables till towards the end of that Satya Yuga and the beginning of the Treta Yuga. That's right. And science will confirm this. So far, the scientists do know that there was a time on this planet when there was no grass. They do know that. They do know that there was a time on this planet when there were no blossoming flowers. So if you look at the Vedic history, although it may seem like mythology, and although the modern Indian, because they're chasing this Western phantasmagoria, they reject that in favor of British standards of academia, European standards of beauty. They will reject their own beauty, get bleaching cream, this disease has spread all over. It's in Jamaica. Oh, that's bad in Jamaica. People walking around looking like transparent zombies. They'll wrap themselves in saran wrap foil, 89 degrees, 78% humidity, and literally burn the melanin off their skin. Don't worry. In your next life, Krishna will give you an appropriate body. You will be a polar bear. You'll be white as snow. You'll be snow white. You'll be a sheep. You'll be whatever you want, <laughs> but you won't get this human form because you don't appreciate it. 
Okay, moving on. Man, I'm all over the place. Always trying to share so much. So in the last age, our life force is centered in food. So if you ain't got no money, you're gonna die young, straight up. Because people who have money usually have access to better education. People who have access to better education make better choices when it comes to food. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So smart people, when you go to smart people's neighborhood, quote unquote smart people, you'll see that they got more vegetarian restaurants or they'll have more holistic restaurants and health food stores. But when you come to El Corona, Queens, and Queens, El Corona, when you come to places like Corona, Queens, the most you're gonna get is some chicharrones. Ain't really too many health food stores around here. You could get plenty of pork, you could get plenty of beef, you could go to the Chinese restaurant and get rat meat. No, I ain't no racist. I'm not being funny. It's straight up. They done found rat meat in plenty of Chinese restaurants. And these kind of restaurants are proliferated mostly in places where people have lower education or lower money. So once again, the duration of life being decreased in Kali Yuga is directly connected to finance and education. Yo, people, y'all gotta wake up. May Eshu bless you. And I'll leave this conversation with one last thought. Years ago in a private, you know, Doc used to have, Dr. York used to have private classes with his disciples. He would teach us things that he would not teach nobody else. I felt like he was, I was only maybe 19 or whatever. I was mad young. And he, I feel like he was planting seeds, you know what I'm saying, for the future, for them to blossom in the future, whatever we supposed to do. I'm fortunate I found Krishna. It just strengthened my position even further. Hold up, the train is coming, let me. It just strengthened my position even further for whatever I'm supposed to do. This Hare Krishna mantra and all of this bhakti yoga is empowering me in a, in a remarkable way. And I have to say thanks to Dr. York for planting the seeds because he told us one thing one time and I don't know if the other disciples even remember it, but he was trying to explain that there were some, there were 24 elders or 24 masters and when they came to this planet, 12 of them came down in Africa and the West, and they came down on the vibration of Ma'a. And this word Ma'a means with, I am with God, Ma'a, right? It just means with or together. And then he said the other 12 came down on Om. They came down on the sound of Om. And one thing Doc said was, when they're coming down from the Crystal City, he said there's a ship over the planet Earth that they come down from. And he said that when they come down, when these 24 elders come down, that they cannot mix the current or else they get electrocuted. And I find that, you know, I hope that's not prophetical because I can't help but see the connections between the East and the West and uh, East Ethiopia and West Ethiopia or Africa and India. I can't help but see the connections and I, I, I you know, I share it all the time. The only thing that I can say that will work in my benefit is the purity of purpose, the sincerity of my message that I'm trying to convey to the world, and the fact that SU is using me as a tool to convey the message of Krishna in this age, I think that's that would be the only reason I would be protected from any karma, and the fact that bhakti yoga is a karma-free activity. So I'm not expecting anything good or bad to come out of this process. I'm enjoying the journey. Hare Krishna! Stop. Okay. What the heck? You know, that's crazy. This is a new 